Hello there and welcome back to the Long Live Rock and Roll podcast with your host, me, Mr. Laz Michaelides, and on the screen opposite me, Mr. Felipe Amarim. How are you doing, man? How are you doing, Laz? How are you doing, everyone? Hope you guys are having a good time. Yeah. Are you okay? Yeah, man, we're good. It's, it, the summer never ends, isn't it? Well, you say that, but I'm I'm looking at a rainy field out here, and it's all dark already, isn't it? Because we record in the evening. It's funny though, because we've had a couple of weeks off. We've both been on our own little holidays, yeah. and when we when we were do when we were recording before, we kind of have like the the end of summer into the autumnal sunshine coming through the window, but now it's just dark at six it's just, it's like, <laughs> Yeah, it just changes like that in Britain, doesn't it? It's still, it's still not cold enough. Uh, you know, no, it's, exactly. it's, it's, this conversation is getting too British. We're talking about the weather. <laughs> Next, we're going to be talking about train times and stuff like that. God, no. So let's <laughs> let's talk about music. Excellent. I let Vaz Felipe say, let's dive straight in. So we, we were talking things British at the start, but we're going to go a bit American here. We're going to talk about an American prog metal band called Dream Theatre and their third album, which is called Awake. So I'll give the little details again. Uh, the album's called Awake by Dream Theatre, released October 4th, 1994, recorded between May and July in 1994 in Hollywood, produced by John Purdell and Dwayne Barron. Genres, prog metal and or prog rock and the length of the album is one hour 15 minutes exactly um first thing i wanted to ask felipe is you chose the album dream theater have more famous albums and this isn't a universally loved one by all of their fans so i have to ask you why did you choose this one or totally like selfish reason because i love this album i think it's just <laughs> really? great maybe the reason why uh the, the reasons why a, a diehard fan wouldn't like the album uh, might be the reasons why i like the album okay um i hope you guys know hearing the sirens in the background here because it's uh quite noisy <laughs> anyway Listen, i think we've accepted yeah. that you live in the middle of soho in london yeah so the soho i, I hope our listeners will just understand that you cannot keep <laughs> soho quiet so yeah don't worry only worry so, so, only worry if they're coming for you okay <laughs> <laughs> no not yet so yeah um so this album, okay, I had this, I had this, I bought this CD back in the day when I was learning drums. And I mean, like, uh, uh, well, I started the drum in 1998. So this album came uh, came about a few years before that. And every musician or, or everyone who wanted to be a musician that I knew was talking about how difficult it was to play dream theater songs. And everyone's talking about uh, how accomplished those musicians were. So that was the reason why I got into, you know, uh, some of their stuff and I wanted to understand what uh everything was all about. And then I I bought this CD recommended by a friend and I loved it. And I loved the uh composition and the arrangements and everything else. Not only the fact they they were like individually amazing musicians, but I thought I thought it was a really good album, diverse enough. And I as I've said a million times here, I'm not really into heavy rock, like really heavy rock. I'm more into classic rock and and rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, and this album doesn't sound that heavy to me. Maybe that's one of the reasons why I like. Maybe it's one of the reasons why some of the fans don't like. Uh, and I think it's got such a range of different songs and and, and interesting lyrics and different uh, um, approaches to songwriting that I think it's it's just it's a brilliant album just to listen uh, start to finish. Uh, I think it's not what the label wanted at the time. So you you, you got to realize that in 1994. You know, grunge was the thing. You know, everyone's listening to Nirvana and Pearl Jam and that kind of stuff. And yeah. and so the label wanted them to be more on the heavy side than the prog side. Okay. And I think they just wanted to do their thing. They had some clashes with the producer on Images and Words, the previous album, which is brilliant and it's probably an album that most people would choose for their podcast. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, but. Um, they they were not happy with some of the uh, 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 the mixing decisions and some of the stuff that the producers did. Uh, then they got some the, the two producers on board. Uh, one or two of them worked with uh, Ozzy Osbourne and some big names. They knew what they were doing. And during the, the, the mixing process, Brain Theater, they, they were kind of uh, uh, interfering too much. And the guy said, look, we know how you guys sound. We want you to sound like you. So get the fuck out of my way, let me mix the album. <laughs> so in the end, they were really happy with the result. Doesn't mean it was an easy album to write. But anyway, I think all the uh, um, all those conflicts about what does the label want, what do you want, uh, mixing all the technicalities behind putting an album together, all of that somehow uh, uh, 
comes across in in, in, uh, in in the music, and I think it's just it's just an interesting album to listen to. So it's a personal decision for me. Mm. Do you like the album, man? What do you think about it? Um, is it is that your cup of tea? The thing is, so if, if we with prog, it, it has to be perfect for me, and what that is is not having time signature and tempo changes for the sake of it not overly long solos that are just getting to the territory of being wanky um but what i do like about all dream theater music i've heard is that it always grooves and what i mean by that is it's not always groovy it's not like you can bounce along to it sometimes it is very straight and very heavy but nearly always they've got the parts perfectly written they they write for the band and not for each other, which is what a, th a few bands can get wrong with prog. They write for themselves as individual instrumentalists to show yeah. off their prowess, their vo virtuosity. I keep, I always make this word up, virtuosity, um, <laughs> virtuosoness, whatever you want to say. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm going to claim that word. Uh, they write for themselves and they think, oh, well, I've got a section here. You know, he's he, he's doing off doing a solo. The drummer's playing a jazz part in 7A. I'm going to mess around here and do something really cool. Whereas I always feel dream theatre write for the song and for the band. Having said that, there's plenty of moments where you think, oh, is, you know, is this going on a little too long now? Or is this just a bit complicated for the sake of it? I'll come to this all, I'll give you all my thoughts in my monologue at the end, but I thought that they, that it's a good balance. And one, th I mean, we're going to go through it in a bit, aren't we? We're going to go section by section, but ultimately, yes, I thought it was a good album. And I say that, and I cho choose that word carefully, you know, I've got a, I've got a criteria of how I'd rate albums from one to 10 and mm. good for me is number six. It's okay. above average. It's above average. I didn't think it was great. I thought it was good. Very good. You know, so that, that's it for me. But I enjoyed it, man. I, I always cannot help but listening to musicians who love what they do um, and who enjoy writing songs and putting the talent and the effort in. Man, I just, I would love to see you bumping into John Petrucci and say, mate, that album, that's a that's a solid six, man. Well done. <laughs> well, six out. Of, six <laughs> well, you wouldn't out of say ten. that to him. I've seen the size of his arms, like no, the guy's yeah, big. You wouldn't say that. To him. He's a monster, isn't he? <laughs> um, so I, this is what I, I had to think about this when I was doing my criteria because six out of ten <laughs> sounds bad. But I'm thinking no, if ten is perfect and nine is outstanding and eight is brilliant and <laughs> seven is great, then surely six has to be good. I, I just, you know, you know me and my my OCD and my lists and everything. You mean um, it's not pet sounds, but it's still a great album. <laughs> yeah, it's not pet sounds. Yeah. Um, uh, what did I have to ask you? Um, how did your friends enjoy it in the nineties? Well, uh, what well, that's the thing. Uh, the girls didn't like it. Uh, my classmates didn't understand any of it at school. Uh, but all my that was a very specific kind of people who liked it amongst my friends. I don't think that's the uh, uh, that that actually represents the, the the all of their audience, but maybe most of it, uh, male uh, young musicians, musicians, or people yeah, who play exactly. play like amateur musicians, people who play for fun, and um, they actually one of one of their members actually said that, that they they are aware that a huge part of the audience is made of musicians. Yeah, so they know. And they sometimes write for those people, you know, I believe. It's like, we're going to yeah. play some complicated stuff that, you know, we know we're capable of and people like. Uh, yeah. I think there's a bit of that. Every album uh, they wrote ha has a bit of that. But the one thing, by listening to the album again now, that really uh, um, really resonated with me is the is the lyrics. And, and, and uh, you know, there's much more to this album than, than I thought it was. Yeah. Uh, well, just a couple of things before we start diving into all, all the artistic part of it. Um, I I suggest that everyone has a, a, a look uh, into the album cover because uh, it was designed by a guy called Larry Fremantle. And there... There's references to song titles and words and and in the album cover. So have a look at it. Like there's a mirror, ah. there's a clock, there is the same. Uh, yeah. Right, there we go. Okay. You know, et cetera, et cetera. So have a look at that. It's really interesting. I don't know if every song is somehow uh, uh, present in that album cover, but I found some references. It's super cool. Um it's interesting that it was their third studio album, so they were already experienced as a band. And the third album, I think, 
is where well you release a first album and and if you succeed people expect you to be to, to prove that you can repeat your formula on the second album and i think mm. they they were really good at that and then when you get to the third album um uh, it's usually when you say well shall we try something different to prove that we can do something different and then yeah. and then it usually flops and it didn't just repeat the formula again on the fourth <laughs> album but i think they did a phenomenal job with that uh apparently the label wasn't happy uh although it was uh, uh number 32 on the uh, billboard 200 so in america so it's pretty cool that's not bad uh, for, for a popular music chart they would only beat that that number that position on the charts in 2007 wow. so so that was their best chart position for a while so it's it's mm. it means it did well for that kind of music right considering that the the, the single is like nine or ten minutes long or something like that yeah. uh and again what so the, here's the thing i would say i don't know if you would agree with me the singles chosen by the for this album were lie caught in the web and silent man a, apart from silent man I, I don't think they were the best choices what would you have chosen uh difficult thing but i would say um It's a difficult thing, but I don't think those those that I would say maybe six o'clock. Yeah. Well, that is I think that is. one is heavier and maybe and it's a shorter song with more parts. Yeah. So it's kind of that could be. Uh, let me check the uh, the, the. What the about what here. about Innocence Faded? Innocence quite, Faded would be better than song. Caught in a Web for me. Yeah. It's such a kind of pop vibe, isn't it? It's an Maybe. accessible song, you know. Yeah, yeah, the mirror, the mirror is not too bad for that. Yeah. For for lie the, for, as well. Well, lie, no, lie was a single, so lie oh, it was, wasn't yeah. it? Right, okay, yeah, exactly. I lie was quite um, short to the point. Uh, I, I like that one, but yeah, the others, you know, and the Silent Man. That's an odd choice, isn't it? Because it it doesn't. It's accessible. It's within your four minute, um, you know, your, the four minute barrier. But it doesn't really show what you can expect if you buy this album. Well, yeah, Silent Man for me is uh it's kind of not um yeah, it's it's it, it doesn't sound like the rest of the albums, like a not pop ballad. Yeah, but but in terms of you know getting some radio play, maybe that's a that's a good choice. Yeah. Uh, you know, rock radio. So because you can't have Silent Man in a in a rock radio, in a heavy metal radio, as in as a heavy metal ballad, or you can have it even in 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 a pop radio. So I think they could. That's that was a, a, for me. A, a, it makes sense to have that one as as a single, but maybe not the other yeah. ones. Again, just my opinion. Um, so yeah. Um, so let's start talking about... Okay. Well, just quickly, before we go into those categories, I just wanted to talk about the, the landscape of where heavy metal was at this point. Yeah, that's because interesting. You mentioned grunge, and grunge is very interesting, because grunge, I mean, there's an argument in itself, is grunge uh, a subset of metal, you know, but that's a whole other episode. Grunge came in 1991, oh. and it killed off glam metal. Glam metal was where the focus of heavy metal was in the 80s. We know from previous episodes, like the Rainbow episode, that heavy metal was largely in Britain from 1970 through to the early 80s. From the mid-80s, kind of 83 to grunge to 91, glam metal was the main heavy metal in the world. And that's where the focus of it was in America. You still had thrash metal coming, you know, Chuck Schuldiner and his band Death literally invented death metal. So you had these things going on in the underground scenes, but in terms of where the focus was, glam metal was where it was at. And then grunge came along and killed it. So metal in terms of mainstreamness almost instantly stopped. Because, like I said, grunge came along and just completely killed it. So this this gave metal a chance to flourish. And in the 90s, you had so many subgenres coming out. Metalcore fused hardcore punk uh, with extreme and thrash metal. New metal came out as a way to make music a bit simpler and combine really unorthodox elements to heavy metal. You had death metal, as I said, Chuck Schuldiner and his band Death refining each album, making it really progressive. And you also had the rise of prog metal. Now, it started at the end of the 80s with bands like, you know, Megadeth, Death and Metallica making those longer albums like Unjustice for All, Rust in Peace, where they were adding in these progressive elements to standard metal songs. And that gave bands like Dream Theater the chance to flourish and say, hold on, what do you mean Metallica writing an eight minute song? Let's make ours 12 minutes. Let's put you know, <laughs> yeah. three, three time signature changes. We're going to put in seven. You know, just bits <laughs> like that. So 
this really, you know, it, it, I think it is important to know that Dream Theater, for those who don't know, if you're a rock fan more than a metal fan, Dream Theater are one of the pioneers and key innovators of progressive metal. Because of them, you end up getting bands like Opeth, who were progressive death metal, you know, taking the pro pro progressive aspects and song lengths and structural complexity that Dream Theater um boasted and then adding low screams to it and then you get your progressive death metal then you you know if you want to add melody instead of the screams you've got progressive melodic metal so dream theater really showed how far you kind of push the boundaries of progressiveness in metal um but yeah i just wanted to say that to, to give yeah, the, yeah, that's, the that, uh, yeah i just want to add something to this because um uh, most people um would say that dream theater invented a, a genre uh, of, of its own isn't it like as as a uh, you know as prog metal uh, um, and that's that's a fair statement because yeah, it, it, had... and it's it, I like the fact that um, they uh, acknowledge that, but not in a how can I put it? It's in a somehow in a humble way because I think Mike Portnoy said in an interview like we didn't actually create anything new; we just put two things that already existed yeah. together. So yeah. and, and, I think um, and then it says that's yeah, but it, that's true because I I I have this feeling that they are as prog as yes and as heavy as Metallica. Uh, yes, that's a fair comment, and I think that with the prog rock of bands like Emerson Lake and Palmer, yes, Genesis. It very much felt like those bands knew they were doing something different. There was the attitude, wasn't there? There was the ego, yeah. you know, putting 20-minute solos in songs and stuff like that. But you're right. With Dream Theater, it was very much uh, it, it, humble. I think you said that word, yeah. didn't you? It's very nice. So as you said, you know, following on from prog rock in the 70s, that's when metal started to get a little more progressive with bands like Queensryche and Rush. Um, I mean, Rush, you love that, don't Rush, you? And Rush is a major influence for, for Dream Theater. And you, I feel you can literally see the progression from a band like Emerson, Lake and Palmer with the prog rock, you know, taking rock music and putting lots of progressive elements in. Rush then coming in and making it heavier rock with the same progressive elements. And then Dream Theater coming out the other side, taking elements from both and making, yeah. you know what I mean? Just turning it into, fusing it into a metal uh product yeah it? exactly and, and you can hear a lot of rush in, in their music and they are like um they are huge fans of rush we're due uh, to do a rush album soon aren't we i think yeah we're going to do a rush album yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. anyway so, um should we, sorry did you have anything to add no no, no i don't think i have tried actually uh i've been growing my beard to look like mike portnoy as Especially and for this episode, you know, you've done a fantastic I've, I've, job, sir. You I've prepared for this. <laughs> Talking about preparing for work, how cool is that? <laughs> that beard looks amazing, sir. Very good job. Very good yeah. job. Um, so, right, I think as you guys can guess, we are not going to go song by song. It is there's too much to unpack in each song. We could do a whole episode on each song, just going about the intricacies of this, that, and that time signature change and this melody. So, what we did is we put our heads together and we came up with five or six categories that we thought best exemplified what was best about the album. And they are this, prog, technicality, songwriting, lyrics, diversity, and influence. So we're just going to go through these and talk about what we see in the album through this category. Um, so let's start off, bro. I'll start off. Um, prog. Prog, progressiveness. Now, we know that prog is literally, in every sense of the word, progressing a style or genre. So this could be anything from, you know, intricate solos, uh, complex song structures, time signature changes, tempo changes, key changes, all of this stuff that... You know, you've got to think, 20 years before, what is a normal pop song? It's a two and a half minute song by the Beatles that goes verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, end. Yeah. So, add, you know, 20 years later, let's try and progress this stuff. You know, we've already gone through rock and psychedelia and metal beginning and all. So now we're pushing the boundaries, seeing how far we can do it. And I think, I mean, it's obvious prog, isn't it? That There's no other way that this is, music is anything except progressive. Well, I, I would say they are more prog than metal at this point, right? At this yeah, point, you know, some people thing. would consider them more like a heavy metal band. But I think if they were more metal than prog, I would probably not listen to the whole album because it's not really the kind of music I listen to. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I say they have that heaviness of a classic rock band or a metal band. But 
well, and they have like influences of classic rock, like Pink Floyd and Deep Purple. They really into that kind of music. They actually played some of. Uh, they've played the the entirety of Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, they've played loads of wow. yeah. They did a whole Iron Maiden album. Uh, if I'm not wrong, was Power Slave. So they, they used to play classic albums. rock albums. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like start to finish uh, in a normal gig. So play half of the gig is their own gig, and the other half is like covers. And wow. they really good. so they they actually really dig into uh, um, into other people's music and learn the whole album and stuff like that. But the one thing about classic rock, you have uh, which it's very musical, in my opinion. It sometimes can be a bit sloppy. It's like it, 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 sometimes the bar count is not really so, you know, like yeah. really strict, and and the timekeeping might be, you know, you might drag or, or rush a little bit uh, intentionally or not. And there's that imperfection in classic rock uh, that makes it uh, um, makes it more human to me in, in, in mm-hmm. many ways. It's not yeah. meant to be to be perfect. Whilst with Dream Theater, they are tight a hundred percent of the time. Yeah, they like they are a machine. They do not mess about in terms of being tight. For me, uh, that it, it usually results in 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 a in, in more boring kind of songwriting. But uh, even though they're really tight, and it's like there's it's almost like there's no room for improvisation. Uh, the the skills they have for composing and arranging are so good mm. that they make that tightness uh, uh, less machine-like and more human, if that makes sense, because the that composition is great. Sense. Yeah, um, and I think w- with with things like time signature changes, you know, so for those who don't know, I think we've said it before in previous episodes, time signature changes, you know, a standard Western popular music song would be in 4-4, four, four, where you count four beats in a bar. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, like that. Time signature changes where you change the amount of beats in a bar. So you might go from 4-4 four, four to 7-8, which would go one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, you know, like that. It kind of... It, and it really messes with where the beat is. And in, in pop, Western popular music, we like knowing where the one is so we can bang our heads or clap in time or whatever. With these time signature changes, it really throws the listener off because they're not sure what's going on or where they're going to yeah. bang their head next. And it's a very complex thing to do as a musician and to, to, to be able to flow seamlessly from one time signature to another is a very progressive aspect and something that takes a lot of practice. And you can hear these time signature changes in songs. like I mean, I think that I th- I, I, I'd hazard a guess there's one in every song. But the way oh, yeah, for sure. the place is most obvious is Erotomania, Voices and Scarred. You've also got tempo changes, which is literally, you know, you play, play a song at one tempo, dun, 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 and then you change it up, bum, 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 dun, 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 and it just, again, it throws the listener off. It makes them uncomfortable. It's like, okay, you settled in at this tempo? No, we're going to go here. And it's just like... Exactly. That's that, that's that's why they're not, let's say, there's not groovy, as I said. You're not going to be simply just like, uh, uh, um, you know dancing to this kind of music yeah, exactly because once you get used to 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 the to the beat they change it yeah, exactly yeah they don't never let you settle do they yeah uh, no. tempo changes again the same three songs you've got them all through erotomania voices scarred a couple of key changes throughout a few songs as well uh unusual compositions this is another progressive element innocence yeah. faded the, the the song ends with a long solo yeah. Normally you'd expect to hear a chorus and then maybe a sort of outro, but we uh, you usually chorus. have the solo halfway through a song, isn't it? Exactly. It's just like, oh, let's check a solo in the end because why not? <laughs> we get the chorus and then it gives us a final solo. Yeah. And Scarred as well. What a complex song. I mean, that is. Uh, well, what do you label the verse? What do you label the chorus? There's about three different solos. You know, <laughs> what's the bridge? And if, even the lyrics, what are they going on about? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll get to right. the lyrics. Yeah. yeah. Um I think that's I think that's um that's it. There's, there's, what, yeah, there's one thing. Say? Yeah, one more thing. Uh it's very common in prog rock that you have concept albums, so a whole album about one specific theme yeah. or or a central idea where everything else comes from. Yeah. And uh there's a song that you don't know probably. There's a song called A Mind Beside Itself. It's not there. Yeah, it's I actually do, yeah. a song divided. You know about that. So it's a song divided in three parts: Erotomania, Voices, and the Silent Man. That was actually one song in three parts. 
So yeah. that's a concept that's like that's very common in prog music. So basically, it's the only part of the album where they go into that kind of stuff. Like, mm. okay, we're gonna have uh, uh, three parts for the same story. Apart from that, the other songs are uh, you know mostly unrelated on their own. Yeah, individual. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Moving on to um, technicality, and what I'm talking about here is how literally how hard it is to play some of these songs on instruments. Um, intricate and complicated solos throughout. Now, this is normally left with John Petrucci on guitar and Kevin Moore on keyboards. Uh, we should actually mention the other band members too. So yeah, as I mentioned the first two, you've got James Labrie on vocals, John Myung on bass, and Mike Portnoy on drums, for those who don't know. Uh, very difficult riffs to play and execute. I'm thinking, you know, caught in a web, there's that bridge middle section which yeah. is just this absolute monster riff that's like and it's just locked in perfectly isn't it explain as a drummer for, I, I mean maybe i should explain as the bass player playing the notes but this is hard stuff to play well matt uh, a couple of things to say about this uh first of all uh john young the bass player he can double any guitar riff at any speed without a plectrum because uh, you know lots of bass players out there they would just cheat and have a plectrum and play just like a guitar player yeah. it's very common in dream theater that they 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 have such a complex riff that you can't really harmonize or play a um a different uh, voice on top of that so you basically the bass needs to play in unison with the guitar yeah and well, it's not that easy to follow John Petrucci, and and oh. <laughs> and and John Young does such a great job with that. It's it's yeah, and he look it looks like he's doing it with no effort at all. It's just like and it's just like it, it, he might be the unsung hero of the band. Um, he is really, a fantastic bass player, absolutely he fantastic, and then he's obviously well known in the bass community for being such a great player. Yeah, um, but yeah. In, in regards to the drums, then uh, I would say like. Uh, uh, as I said, Russia was a massive influence, and 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 uh, Mike Portnoy's kit resembles a lot what uh, New Pert had, and also Terry Bozio and some of those uh, uh, prog rock drummers who had gigantic drum fill. Drum is, is that what you're talking about? He had a lot of drums in front. He of He had like it, it's it's a whole because when you listen to a normal drum kit, we're more in the low end of the mm -hmm. mix, right? Uh, as drummers, we have uh, uh, our instrument doesn't sound as high pitch as a guitar or sax. So you kind of belong to a certain range in the mix. Whilst Mike Portnoy would have some some really small tones and some really big and deep ones. So the kit is so big, there's a whole range of sounds in it. And it's it's obviously very common that people have that to look cool on stage and they don't use half of it. And uh Portnoy uses every inch of that kit. And yeah. it's just Absolutely amazing in musical. He was uh, definitely one of the most influential drummers of the 90s. He was, um, I, I don't know the exact number, but like he got uh, the uh, Modern Drummer Magazine award for uh, best prog drummer, or best prog rock drummer. I don't, I don't know what's the name of the thing, but for prog, I think he won something like 10 consecutive years or something like that he's, yeah he's like he is the drummer's favorite in that in that style yeah. and 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 but, and what he does in my opinion is not merely uh and purely technical i think his musical idea is really good because he's a guy who's learned to play mostly by learning songs and learning how to sound like john bonham a new bird and 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 uh, I don't know, probably Bill Bruford and some other prog rock drummers as well. So he loved those guys and he wanted to sound like them. And he's got influences of Ringo Starr and Nick Mason, who who you probably wouldn't put in the technical side of, you know, what you know, yeah. uh, the best drummers out there, but very creative. So he he got ideas from like every sort of classic rock and prog rock drummer and heavy metal drummers, and you can see in in his compositions that everything uh, is present. In his well, it always feels like there's a beat behind the music. It all it doesn't feel like he's trying to be part of the specialness of the song. It doesn't feel like he's trying to show off. It always feels like he is there to underlie the beat and the groove that is going on in the guitars and bass and keys. 
Yeah, I, I feel I feel the same about about his drumming. I think it's yeah. it's it's very musical. It's not again. It's not a style that as a as a drummer. It's not a style that I play or or I don't remember learning any of their songs like start to finish. But I would learn a couple of grooves and fills because I found it really really interesting. And yeah, very creative. And yeah, and in a, in a weird way, plays to the song. You know, as we say, we usually say plays. I... You play to the song when you do something simple. Yeah. Uh, but it's can I ask you a question? Yeah. I'm asking this as a fan of Tool, and I'm, I'm sure yeah. if someone is listening who's a Dream Theater fan, you must like Tool as well. Um, yeah. What's the difference between Mike Portnoy and Danny Carey? Oh, that's that's a tough. Is one. Danny Carey more focused on the? I don't want to say showing off, but is he more focused on making his instrument one entity on its own to be played with? the one entity of the bass, the one entity of the guitar and the one entity of the vocals of Tool. Whereas Mike Portnoy, like we said, is always providing, although he's very complex what he's playing, he's always providing a backbeat to the song. I, I, I think what you said, what you said, what you said make, makes perfect sense. I would just add that, well, I'm not really familiar with Tool, but I know some of their songs and I know how, how complex it is as well. Uh, I just think, yeah, Mike Portnoy would be more like a classic rock drummer uh, in that sense he, he he was playing is he was playing a pro rock music with dream theater but i think if you listen to some of his other projects he's more into groove than phrasing if that makes sense so perhaps if they were given a choice to go back and play in bands from the 70s mike portman might go and play with deep purple and pink floyd and danny carey might go and play with emerson lake and palmer and genesis right that's that that would be a fair claim i I think that makes perfect sense perfect yeah um Excellent. So, uh, on to the next category, which is song. Oh, no, just no, just a couple oh, of sorry, things. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, 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 yeah. That, 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 this, just one thing oh, uh, about yeah. James Labrie, um, because again, uh, I think Labrie gets a lot of criticism for. He does. Oh, uh, yeah. you know, it's not the best guy in the band. Well, how can you follow that level of musicianship, being a singer, right? Not an yeah. instrumentalist, and. Yeah, and it's some people a tough say, job, isn't it, to be the singer? It's a of tough Dream job, <laughs> and some and sometimes people say, yeah, no, his live performances are not like the album. Well, you can record one song a day, or even one verse or one line at the time when you're recording vocals or any instrument. But when you go and perform it live, you've got to have the the stamina and the technique, and you know, and 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 also for a singer to be healthy enough. Uh, uh, to go there and deliver the same level of performance, so it's not it's not it's not an easy task, especially for that kind of music. I think, apart from having impressive vocal range and technical control when singing the high, when you sing the high pitch notes, some people don't have the the, the proper technical control. So he goes from one uh, uh, from the, the the bottom end of his voice to the, to to the high end of his voice with uh, with total control. In my opinion, it sounds really good doing that. Uh, though he gets some criticism for for that, which I think it's unfair. I saw him live; it was flawless when I saw him. Live. You've, you've seen Dream Theater live? Yes. Oh. Uh, download. You were there. Were you there? They've played that download. The yes. year we went to probably were not watching this gig because like, they had like uh, loads of things going on. I think I, oh, I remember that. I think I saw yeah, it on the band. Yeah, they Remember yeah. that? Yeah. So so. Uh, Basically, one thing is I notice when he plays live, he doesn't simplify melodies to make it easier for him to sing live. He just goes for it. So uh, yeah. I think there's there's a good balance between technique and feeling, uh, and he can sing ballads with with emotion and, and expression as well. He's not. Brilliant. I think I think he's really good. I think he sh- he deserves even more credit, in my okay. opinion. Yeah, well, I'm going to talk about him a bit later as well. Um, so on to the songwriting. Uh, one thing I found that was very impressive about the album was the blend between he- um, heaviness, technicality, and melody. I thought that despite all the technical riffs and passages you've got going on, there is a melody either in the keyboards or come before in the vocal melody yeah. that balances it out. And just really kind of says, right, we're going to give you two minutes of heaviness here with some really intricate technical riffs, but you're going to get a bridge after with a lovely, simple vocal melody. It really works. 
Yeah, they, it's like they give you some room to breathe, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in, in the same way, I've got written, for moments of brilliance and flash, there is also many simple moments that contrast each other but complement the difficult sections. For example, The Silent Man. So many simple melodies in that song. And I think it's a yeah, fantastic yeah. place to put that song in the album because you've had a litany of five and a half minute heavy metal prog metal bangers filled with technical riffs crazy solos and everything and then they ease it off with the silent man and they exactly halfway through the break. album yeah exactly perfect timing for that song as i'd say yeah, yeah. um no, and so just a few of those you know a few of these uh songwriting brilliance throughout uh, 6 a.m., I thought the drumming was so powerful in it. The start of that song, the drums just come in and really set the tone for how heavy the album's going to be. Yeah. So that, yeah, um, that first song, 6 o'clock, isn't it? So how, how is it how is it called? Yeah, 6, yeah. Oh, what do I call it? 6 a.m., yeah, 6 uh, Yeah, I think 6 o'clock. Anyway. <laughs> in, 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 in the, it just in the says song. 6 zero, zero, right? So in, in, in the, the song, same. In the song, the voice goes 6 a.m. on a Christmas morning, doesn't yes, it? Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, 6 o'clock on a Christmas morning, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it's a, I think that song's got uh, the interesting mix of being groovy and heavy at the same time. That is it, that It's is jazzy, thing. isn't it? It has jazzy. It is, it is. Well. And it's, it's, it's the, 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 the first groove is really funky. It starts with a kind of Rush-esque kind of drum fill yeah. from, from high to low. Uh, long drum fill into a really funky groove, which is not very common for that kind of uh, a band. Mm. And it's and the vocals are quite aggressive. It's a really interesting way of starting an album, showing that amount of power and distortion with the vocals. I really liked it. It makes a statement, doesn't it? You know, it does. It does. Um, what I did also like on the album was the amount of soft songs because I think that with an album like this. And you've got to remember, it's an hour and 15 minutes long. That's a long album. Yeah. If you just had an hour and 15 minutes of this heaviness with the technicality, I think it's easy to lose a listener or to, to, oh, to yeah. have someone go, i got to take a break. Like This is just a bit too much. But they kept putting songs in that matched the quality of the other songs in terms of actual quality of song, but not necessarily the technicality. Innocence Faded softer in feeling but still a heavy sound acoustic guitars less technicality more emotion much more accessible and poppy agreeable and pleasant music and melodies with harmonies in the vocals we didn't get this before and it's no. a lovely change but the song doesn't feel out of place does it no it doesn't and i think when you listen to innocence faded and caught in a web uh they have really catchy choruses they they could be pop music. Just if you yeah. isolate the chorus and and you have different instrumentation, that could be, they could be great choruses for for any pop band out there. And it's the partially or mostly because of the the vocal delivery, in my opinion. But Dream you Theater know? have used their their quality of composition and songwriting to say we've got two pop choruses here, but we're going to make this one sound heavy and technical, and we're going to yeah. make this one sound soft and accessible. Brilliant, isn't it? Why not? Isn't it? Uh, so, and and I think uh, um, and Space Divest the uh, the last song. I really want to go back to this song when we're talking about lyrics because you will. It's one of my favorites. Uh that was entirely written by uh, Kevin Moore, the keyboard player who left the band. Uh, immediately after the the album, so he didn't do the tour, and that's his one song, very much. And he did that song is the last song of the album, the last song he he wrote with the band, and yeah, it's entirely he... his composition, and it's yes. a beautiful piece of music. Who could easily fit in a Pink Floyd album, in my opinion. I agree. I love that song. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, we did already mention a mind beside itself, which, as you said, is the songs Erotomania, Voices, and the Silent Man. Yeah, it's one kind of movement. Now, I wanted to talk about this because it's not the first time they did it. They did it on their first album. They had a song which was had one title and then they split it into four parts. And what this reminds me of is, I, maybe I could have left this for the diversity part, but classical music. Because we have what we call in classical music a sonata form where you have three pieces of music that come under the uh the, the one piece you know i'm making this up but let's say mozart's 30th symphony it let, let's say it was in sonata form he'd have an a section a b section and a c section mm -hmm. or it would be an a section a b section and then the, the c section would be coming back with themes from a but in a completely different scenario yeah. 
And I love that they've done this here. It's like they, it's like the, the songs don't sound the same at all. Well, Art of Many has the, has the melody of Silent Man played as a guitar solo. My exact point. They've taken yeah. the themes from one and stuck it in the other in a different way. And I think this is just great songwriting from Dream Theater because you it see... Is. But that's what you know, we know. We mentioned when we did the Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and the Genesis, and the Yes episodes. Classical music is such an important part of progressive music, because uh, progressive music in rock and metal, because rock, essentially hard rock and rock, came from the blues. Metal, when you take metal, started establishing itself when you started taking the blues out of the music. You know, when, when, yeah. when Black Sabbath omitted blue chords and blue notes, that's when we found that, oh, holy shit, we got metal now. Yeah. But it still came from the blues. In Europe, in the in, in Europe... In and you the, still have the swing of the blues. When you listen to Sabbath some, and Deep Purple, mainly yes. they swing like a blues band. The early metal, there was yeah. still the swing, but the notes they used removed the blues from it. Yeah. Whereas in Europe, in, in places like Germany, they have a classical background. So countries like America and England have the bluesy background, and that's why you know, like what we said, what we said, that the 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 music, rock music, inherently came from the blues. Whereas in Europe, they had the classical background. They kind of they they weren't happy with the blues coming in. Um, but I just say this because I'm I'm saying that in America and the UK, classical music as part of rock music wasn't a big thing, which yeah. is why it was so big when the prog rock bands of the seventies came along. And you're getting this influence here as well, aren't you? You're getting Dream Theater saying, listen, we know Emerson Lake and Palmer Genesis, yes, we know, you know, we know what you did for prog. We're gonna do the same here. Let's um let's stick in classical notes, classical solos, play it like a play it as perfectly as a classical piece of music. And exactly. also we're just gonna mess around a bit. We're gonna have one song, but we're gonna give it three parts, just like a classical uh, piece of music, like a symphony or a sonata or something. Yeah, that was yeah, exactly that and and that's that's really uh, um unique when you think about it until a heavy band doing that kind of stuff in 1994 yeah and uh, i think the interesting thing about erotomania is they all had that's the one song where everyone had their ideas uh somehow fit into the song yeah and it's maybe the only song in, in the album that you can actually notice they're just piecing things together instead of uh, yes. they didn't write as one piece they yeah. had to put some parts together, make sure that it worked. And uh, um, one of, I don't know which bit of the song was originally part of Paul Meander, that was their first uh, oh. single um, and the first hit, actually. Um, and so it's it's there. They didn't use, like, a few years uh, earlier, and they're just like, oh, let's put it, let's put in this song. Uh, Lie was initially part of The Mirror, uh, and uh, it's just, yeah. it was just one small uh, a bit of the song and Labrie said no there's there's enough there for for it to be a song on yeah. itself so he convinced them to, to to write the whole thing um and just one more thing i want to say about the songwriting in the album actually i have a question for you but uh one of the things is uh the arguments they had uh during the the composition apparently mike portnoy said something about you know if there is uh if no one was uh, uh maybe at some point, people wouldn't agree with uh, on like what's the third note on bar sixty four? You know, okay. is it C or C sharp? They would go on, go on and on. Um, yeah, that, that was the result of a lack of leadership in a certain way because most bands have a have a boss. Yeah, like Steve Harris in Iron Maiden, right? Or 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 like John Lennon initially with the Beatles and then Paul McCartney. So with uh, Dream Theater, everyone has their say about everything. So that took some time for them to get into an agreement for some of the songs. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. That's the first album where they used the seven-string guitar. And I want to ask you, how do you think that affects songwriting when you have a seven-string guitar as opposed to a six-string guitar? Uh, well, um, I can only speak as a metal fan, player, musician, whatever. It opens up a range of possibilities because if you've got a guitar um, and you're playing in standard tuning, you know, actually, I've got one here. I won't play it, but if you've got your you, you've got your chords, okay, you've got your yeah. F, G, A, B, C, and you can generally, for, for listeners, 
listening i've just picked up a guitar <laughs> uh, you can generally get the, the the lowest you can get is within this kind of range here the last few notes and if you want to make a heavy riff you're kind of limited if you want to have a heavy riff that sounds like it's low and you're using the lower tones of the guitar you're limited to about five or six notes once you start getting up here you start moving to the next string up and so naturally obviously the note gets higher and in metal generally if you're moving higher you're getting away from the heaviness um not that's not an exclusive thing it just generally adding another string below <laughs> means that you've got a whole other set of five notes well more, yeah it's five or six notes that you can then incorporate so you've got the option if you're playing a chord in a chorus that you want to let ring out you've got five more notes to set your starting chord. If you wanna play a riff filled with as many notes as possible, you've got a whole other string to, so it's a you know, riff that goes with another string, you go and you can just mess around. And it's almost, you know, guitarists who use seven strings of guitars, some people think it's unnecessary, but it really does open up a massive can of worms for guitarists and songs. yeah, I, th I, I think it might result in a more riff based kind of composition, isn't it? It makes you think of riffs when it, and I yeah. I believe also it sounds darker somehow. Definitely, you know, maybe that's and that that really makes sense uh, with uh, the lyrics on the album, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. perfect to move on to the lyrics. But I did just yes. have one more point about songwriting, and I wanted to talk to you about this because it's a drumming mm. thing. You know, in the mirror. How yeah. good is the intro? Because they play <laughs> one riff and Mike Portnoy changes the feel of the riff three times before the verse comes in. He changes so, the groove, so it's like he's interpreting the beat in three different ways it's uh, whilst phenomenal. the riff is still the same. The riff, is really just, the riff is just going something like dun 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 And there's one point where he's like boom, ja, boom, ja. Then he goes boom, bagaka, da, dun, bagaka. I, I just done it wrong because that's yeah. the same feel with more notes. Listen to the song. He changes yes, three different, one, uh, yeah, yeah, three before, different groups, yeah, and then the third one he goes double time, doesn't he? It's just yeah, like, it's, it's insane. I, and uh, mind you, he was a big fan of John Bonham, and when he listened to Kashmir, uh, Led Zeppelin is play the whole band is playing three four, and John Bonham is playing four four on top of it. Yeah. It, it sounds a lot like that because they said no, this sounds a bit too complicated. I'm going to impose. A simple groove on top of it and that's what he does at the beginning of the mirror play something really simple straightforward probably the first groove that every drummer would learn and then he just moves on to into different interpretations of the same beat amazing yeah. brilliant isn't it um, yeah cool. let's move on to the lyrics uh, you had quite a lot to say about the lyrics why don't you oh take man it? loads loads uh yeah, I'm, I'm, for it. yeah so i'm i want to uh, i want to say this uh uh where I started actually digging into the lyrics, which I haven't done uh, when I was young and listened to the album, was all about the instruments and everything. So other bands, I would pay attention to lyrics, but with Dream Theatre when I was young, was it was all about the grooves and, uh, and and the riffs and solos and just being amazed by, you know, how well they play. Yeah. But the lyrics are a big part of this album. And sorry for the metal fans out there, but heavy rock usually... For me, the lyrics are usually a bit silly, nine, nine out of ten times, you know, talking about medieval wars. or <laughs> yeah. I, I just thought it just doesn't really resonate with me. Uh, whilst Dream Theatre, their lyrical content is is very down to earth and is about, you know, common people's uh, mental struggles and, 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 and relationship problems. Not in a cheesy way, right? So they, <clears throat> so they're talking about things that everyone can somehow relate to, but in a very creative way. I think one uh, big element that, that influenced the, the the compositions for this album and the, and the lyrics was the fact that Kevin Moore was leaving the band. He was yeah. already too far apart from them musically, uh, creatively, and and personally, and and I think everyone noticed that. So the song Six O'clock was written by him, the lyrics, um, and it's about that distance right mm -hmm. and uh there's 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 a few lines that i really like can't find the strength but he's got promises to keep um and wood to chop before he le his leaps so that basically for me yeah. it's, it's like i don't even want to play anymore i don't want to be here i don't want to record an album i don't want to go on tour but i have promises to keep you know you're committed to do that just until a certain point and it sounds like it's about that could be but it's definitely about 
him leaving the band. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> and Innocence Faded was written by Petrucci. And it's about the fact they were childhood friends. You know, they were mates since they were really young, uh, him and, and Kevin Moore. And he he was really hurt by the fact that they were not connected anymore and they were yeah. clearly going separate ways. So again, yeah, it's a beautiful, brilliant melody, Innocence Faded, great song. So yeah, so it's about both those songs, Six O'Clock and, and uh, Innocence Faded, are about the growing distance between Kevin Moore and, and the rest of the band, especially Petrucci. Yeah. And um, Mike Portnoy had a, a really... Uh, uh, personal moment writing the lyrics for the mirror if i'm not wrong is the first lyric he wrote on his own without being a partnership yeah, I read that uh, well, yeah. and that's about his battle with alcoholism uh it's a really really personal thing for for someone to write in a song and uh, i think he was really open and honest with that and and it's and again makes the song really dark you know mm. it's already heavy yeah. and 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 deep and and with and when you know what the lyrics are all, are all about, so then you know how how sad and, and dark it actually is. Um, uh, Caught in a web is a it's a rock and roll moment for me in terms of you know the freedom of rock and roll because it's about uh, um, not accepting the life that people want to impose on you and just live life in your own terms. So basically, there's a, there's a line that I really like: try to live the life. Um, I try to live the life you live, and so it doesn't work for me. So uh, it's it's basically I don't, I don't I don't want to be like everyone else. I want to do my own thing. It's a it's it's a it's a common theme in in rock music, isn't it? We talked about this in other albums. And voices uh, is about uh, mental illnesses, and uh, basically, uh, Petrucci said he was reading an article. He was researching the theme in order to write the song, and he was reading an article about this man who really believed that his skin was inside out. Wow. So he thought, and he was going like completely nuts about it. And it's, and, 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 and it's, it's about, you know, the voices in your head and the fact that you, 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 you're not connected with reality anymore. I think it's, it's a really dark theme. Yeah. And, and, uh, and when you get into a silent man, that's about, uh, uh, the lack of communication between family members or, 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 or couples is when you no longer connect with someone and you're trying to find that, you know, uh, yeah, it's just quite a, 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 it's quite connection, a big maybe. self-reflective album, isn't it? It's looking at. Oh yeah. Um, but most, but I, it, my problem with, with the album and I'll tell you what's the exception is, it's way too sad when you actually look into the lyrics They they're not, giving you any any reasons to smile is like yeah you know we all we all <laughs> fucked up and that's it you know some people are uh, literally going crazy yeah. and relationships are, 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 um, are problematic and you know father and son can can speak can't speak as they used to etc it feels like it's what it is mm. but then you have lifting shadows of a dream written by John Young and and it, it began as a poem and and two chords. That's all he had. He brought that to the band, wow. and they turned into into a whole composition. And it's about a man and a woman, and how the duality of their relationship can help them complement each other. I found this quote some somewhere, and I put it here exactly as it is. So it's is the only song where I felt like there's hope. there's a bit of hope. You know, yeah. you know, we're different, but we can work it out. So yeah. I think it's a beautiful song because of that. Lovely. And yeah, those are my uh comments on on the lyrics and i love the lyrics and i think uh they they really worked hard on the lyrics as okay. as well as they did with the instruments which i believe is not common in heavy metal my uh you well, know it's, it's funny you say that because as, it is actually right around this time when metal started taking lyrics more seriously yeah. uh maybe oh, that's not fair maybe a little earlier you know towards the end of the 80s but you're right about the 70s you got satan and you got rainbow and dio singing about you know medieval castles and wizards in the sky uh and then from the 80s kind of you know mid 80s onwards they started look you know talking a bit more seriously and then you know, um, death metal uh, that started off singing literally about death, gore, and violence. But then I've mentioned him three times already. I'll put one of his songs in the playlist. Chuck Schuldiner and his band Death, who I've, if you can't tell, I've recently come from studying this band, and they are they're <laughs> fascinating. They literally, this one guy literally almost single handedly invented death metal and changed it 
five or six times over the course of seven albums. Um, but anyway, he, he's, he went from singing about the gore and the violence and the blood to start looking at more introspective themes to then moving on about existentialism and what you know what we're we doing on this planet to then move on about depression and so we were seeing you know the start of the 90s metal kind of taking itself more seriously lyrically and i think this you know dream theater speaks to that especially this album um but yeah great points about the lyrics man they're, they're very good although dark and a bit depressing they are they are great lyrics i have to say yeah um, to sort of do the final category, you know, we're talking about diversity and influence. So diversity, all I wanted to do here was just point your point the finger towards some other as, uh, other styles of music we heard. And we've kind of done it already, but I'll just list the ones I got. Six o'clock, you've got this, a few jazz influences. And, all, and also the, the intro is kind of funky, isn't it? It really reminded yeah. me of the purple, um, yeah. just that funky heavy rock thing. Classical music in the keyboard, um, guitars and bass. And what I'm talking about here is as you said earlier there's no jamming they're not jamming on a you know on a kind of bluesy riff it is all perfectly in place just like classical music richie blackmore did it with deep purple and rainbow i mean deep purple was kind of jammy in places but especially with rainbow richie blackmore all of his solos were just beautifully classical no not many blue notes just stick okay i'm going to stick to this scale and then i'm going to go here it's very organized classical music and i think you get that throughout the album here um and yeah the, the chorus of the mirror i thought was quite groovy which was quite different to the rest of the choruses um and then move on to the final point influence and the, the only thing i wanted to do with this uh category was just stress to listeners and viewers who don't know the impact dream theater have had on music and more specifically metal dream theater essentially inspired a whole generation of of metal musicians now there are other bands to put in as well you know megadeth and their 1990 album rust in peace uh chuck shoulder and death again you know they, they they inspired people to pick up guitars and instruments but to truly show how far and how technical you could make a piece of music it inspired bassists keyboardists guitarists drummers and I'm only not saying vocalists because he didn't have as hard of a job to do as the others. Uh, uh, debatable, but you get what I mean, right? The, yeah, yeah. the technicality. Can you speak to how, how people and musicians you know, how highly they think of Dream Theatre? I, I pretty much don't know a single professional musician who would make any negative comments about any of, of uh, Dream Theater musicians, even if they don't play that style, even if they've never learned any of those songs, even if they say, well, that's a bit boring for me or whatever, everyone respects how uh, technically capable those guys are and how 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 high uh, are the, you know, the, the um, how high is the level of the their abilities for for everything for executing yeah. solos and riffs and even uh, creating songs in different time signatures? So I think Absolutely. they are yeah like well known from being some of the best musicians in the world. Mike Portnoy, uh, John Young, and John Petrucci studied at uh, Berkeley College of Music, which is you know the uh, most famous and renowned uh, music university or college. Uh, in the world, so some of the best musicians in the world passed through that place, and they they did. I don't don't even know if they actually finished uh, the the, uh, the course, but they've been there. I think they passed the early. Music. Yeah, well, maybe I don't know, but they've they've been there studying, you know, music to a really high standard. So they are very academic, but creative, yeah. or academic and creative. It's worked goes hand in hand for an album like this, isn't it? Brilliant yeah, stuff. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Um, do you want it before I do my monologue? You want before you do your monologue, we're gonna hear the first ever Felipe monologue. Oh, wow! You got it. Can you, you believe sprung that? that on me? I did yeah. not expect that. I, I didn't expect until like um, <laughs> four hours ago when I was reading my notes, preparing for this episode. I started writing in a more poetic way about this album. And I was listening to it like in my bed, like just like uh, lights out, and I was just like listening and 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 thinking about it. And I wrote a monologue, or I think it, it can be considered a short monologue. Uh, so forgive my my English. Oh, let's go. Here, bro. here I go. Here I go. <clears throat> Let me have uh, my my. Me, me, ma, me, me, ma, me, ma, ma. <laughs> Your vocal warm ups. <laughs> yeah, haven't prepared this really well, but it's written here. <clears throat> so. 
the album is much deeper than I remember it to be. References to religion, family conflicts, the end of a friendship, mental illnesses, all wrapped up with heavy riffs and complex grooves, resulting in a masterpiece of musicianship and creativity. Awake is darker than most albums of this genre, and maybe not so easy to listen if you're not ready to question reality and face your own dark side. Despite the sadness and pain that seem to be to have inspired most of the lyrics, the listener will always get caught in moments of unquestionable musical excellence. Impossible not to admire how a human can master an instrument to the point of being capable of delivering such technically advanced melodies, riffs, and solos without losing connection with the feeling that ignites creativity and art. Bro, that was beautiful. <laughs> that's it. Wow, that's lovely. First ever. I, I think that's really nice because you, I, I can tell. It's funny because the Beatles are one of your favorite bands, right? Yeah. And you love Rubber Soul, but I haven't heard you speak about Rubber Soul the same way that I just heard you speak about the album. I can really tell you have a connection with this album. And it's really I didn't even awesome. know how much I liked this album until I started <laughs> listening to it again. So this is fucking great. There you go. And I'll, I'll tell you this. When I first started, at 6 o'clock and all that stuff, I was like, oh, my God, here I go again, just listening to complicated, heavy shit. I don't want to listen to this. And then when I started reading the lyrics and I started noticing those nuances on guitar and 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 some keyboard tones and the stories behind it and the fact that one member of the band was was leaving and and the whole sadness around it that really uh uh you know uh really made me more emotional about it and i loved it i love i think it's a great album it is in my opinion it's a masterpiece they did a great job anyway great that's stuff. it uh looking Lovely. forward to hear your monologue excellent all right well we'll finish up with my little monologue then um <clears throat> So I think it is a really finely balanced album, carefully walking the tightrope. On one side, overplaying, time signature changes for the sake of it, songs much longer than they need to be. But on the other, beautiful, tasteful musical passages, simple melodies and exquisite virtuosic moments. James Labrie's vocals, whilst not to everyone's taste, brings the much needed simplicity that compensates from the technical and intricate musicality that the album so strongly boasts. Musically, it is, like most Dream Theatre albums, performed and executed flawlessly, not a note out of place or where it shouldn't be. The solos from Petrucci are so inspirational that they would make anyone want to pick up a guitar. Moore's keyboard playing, whether virtuosically matching a Petrucci passage or embellishing moments with atmospheric sounds and effects, creates the atmosphere around each song that really needs to be there to keep the listener interested. Myung and Portnoy are the dream team of rhythm sets. Sections, when we have so many moments of brilliance and flashiness from Labrie, Petrucci or more, you need that rhythm section to just sit back and hold down the groove slash riff. The best compliment I can give them is that sometimes I forgot they were there. And I mean that in a good way, you know, the best thing a rhythm section can do is keep the groove so tight that you forget you're listening to a, a band. And as already mentioned, Labrie's excellent vocal performance ties it all together and brings balance to the force that is Dream Theatre, cementing their place in prog metal history as key pioneers and innovators, beginning to demonstrate how far you could take metal music and progress it. I can I didn't actually that your clap didn't come through, so the listeners might not have heard that either. But yeah, thanks. <laughs> See, that, they are a great couple of monologues, man, isn't it? We, we've smashed this. <laughs> yeah, we should make a career out of this. What do you guys do? Are we writing monologues about albums? Because reveals are not good enough. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> but no, man, I mean, I feel like even just talking through it with you has made me enjoy it a little more, looking back on it, because the circumstances that are occurring in people's day-to-day -day lives whilst an album is being written and recorded does matter. And I think it was great, you know, that the tension between Moore and the rest of the band, it didn't show on the album. Moore, Kevin Moore really did a good job here because it's from, from all intents and purposes, it seems like he was pissed off. Didn't want to be in the band, didn't want to tour, didn't want to write, yet he puts in a performance like that. That's a professional right there. Yeah, and what a way to leave a band, isn't it? Yeah, right. just, just well, especially like, with the final is. song, Space, what's yeah. it called? Die Vest? What's it called? Space Die Vest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. The one thing I forgot to say about this song is a quick story to. Uh, uh, um... Let's end with a story then. Go on. Yeah. He wrote that song. 
he was uh, he 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 broke up with his girlfriend and he was a bit sad, and he was reading like he was going through a a um, fashion magazine, and he said he fell in love with the model that was wearing something that they called space divest. Wow. <laughs> and there's like if That's it was weird. like how silly am I? I'm looking at the person that you know is just a picture. Yeah. And the song is about that, the feeling of him getting completely lost in a in a in a in a feeling of like he was searching for something that he he couldn't have because it was just his way of uh, avoiding thinking about the end of his relationship. And that's wow, a be- gee, beautiful, man. beautiful song, beautiful way that's of ending the, an album, isn't it? One of my favorite songs. I thought it was a fantastically written piece. Go on then. Uh fi- literally final thing to finish off. What's your favorite song? Mm. Uh Lifting Shadows of a Dream. Okay. Yep. It's my favorite. Yeah, that's a lovely one, that one. I think I'd go for Space Divest. Really enjoyed it. I thought it was it was the the cherry on top. It's kind of like yeah. got a, 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 an album with lots of variety, even, you know, soft songs, acoustic songs, a ballad, heaviness, really long songs, and then they top it off with another piece of music that doesn't fit musically with the rest of the album, but as a concept – at the end of the album, just does a fantastic job. Uh, I yeah, and it's it's uh, it's very different from from the rest of the album, and it's uh, yes. I think it's kind of unpredictable. But not isn't out it? of place. Yeah, different, really but not out of place, isn't it? Yeah, fantastic. Anyway, well, guys, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Long Live Rock and Roll podcast. We hope we hope you've enjoyed this one. Is this the first metal one we've done? Oh no, we did Metallica, didn't we? And we've we done Black Metallica, Sabbath as yeah. well. We got to um, do some Iron Maiden in the future. Oh, we? for sure, yeah, for sure, too. and. Um, we already said, uh, what do we say? Rush as well. We're going to do yeah. it in the next few months as well. So yeah, yeah and I think you know, now, I, now I can I can get rid of my Portnoy beard. Are you, are you really going to get rid of it now? No. Or are you going to keep yeah, it? Yeah. No, no, I'm good. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. No, I like it. I think it suits you. Um, but yeah, uh, so if you like your metal, stay tuned. We do our classic rock. We do our rock and roll. We do some pop even, you know, the 70s and 80s. Uh, but, you know, we're here for everything. And we don't want you to just pop along for one episode. If, you, if you're a Dream Theater, Dream Theater fan and you've seen this episode and you've come to have a listen, stay. You know, go check out the episodes before and the episode after. What we want to do is we want to remind people of all the albums throughout rock and roll you know, in quotation marks, rock and roll's history that have had their place and deserve their place and deserve to be remembered and spoken about in the years to come. And that's what we're here to do, to try and remind you that these albums exist. And if you know they exist, come and listen to our opinions on it anyway. Why not? Guys, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Take care and we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot for joining us. Keep on rocking, everyone. As usual, take care and long live rock and roll.